All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the World Qualifier Playoffs. Once again, I am the Commander reporting in for duty. If you are joining us after you took a look at the live stream, I apologize that we had to cut the power there. Uh, unfortunately, my computer literally just fried. Um, TTS too strong, and so unfortunately not able to stream the game live, but we are at least able to bring you this recording, luckily, through the magic of uploads. So to recap what we have here, Ryan versus Eric, the top four, uh, excuse me, the top seed cuts here. Ryan is the fourth seed, Eric is the fifth seed. We've seen the draft already taken place here. Ryan bringing Tlakali, Brilvar, Vorhild, and Nantaka. Eric bringing at the top of our screen, Vorhild, Freyhill, uh, Ekrit, and Astrida. Our victory conditions, as you can see, the Tamer, right breach, and left breach. Carito, as the higher seed, elected to go first. And, of course, Eric then responded by bringing his outsider. So we are a little bit into the beginning here of turn one, as we can see. Let's go ahead and see what we've got on the board here. Ryan electing to go with the move lead worship actions of the Nantaka over in lane number one. Remember that on the three lane map here, the areas are kind of subdivided by color. Blue on our left red in the center, and then yellow on the right. Um, but more importantly, the white lines only exist around the dome areas. The dome areas do count as two separate parts of one unit, similar to the way Ashen Pass works. So in all, we're looking at four control zones, two of which are important for the victory conditions. We see that Eric is going to go ahead, move his way into the dome there with the fray hill, and get her set up as well, trying to control the dome. Ryan going to respond with the Tlakali, moving her over into lane one, trying to get control for the left breach here in priority claims, going to delete the minion here, and then I presume potentially, oh, the plus three on the flip. We hate to see it. Hate to waste those plus threes on the minion. Uh, of course, Eric is, I'm sure, happy about that. And then, of course, again, bringing those protective pillars down. This ensures that Tlakali will be able to protect the minions in the event that Eric tries to attack them. Now, Eric does not actually have Korjoff. Uh, I thought he did earlier, but um, in fact, does not have that piercing ability there. And so most likely not going to see a whole lot of damage. Uh, we do see, however, the Ekrit going straight for the pillar there, taking out the pillar with an easy shot from the Ekrit and then going for a lead action as well. Going to, again, try to control that lane very early on in order to build the momentum and pressure. Obviously, in this case, there are three lanes. The center lane doesn't really matter that much, given that the left and the right lanes, if any tower explodes on the perimeter, game is over for that player. So we do see that Nantaka has a lead down for Ryan so far in lane one. Eckert has a lead in lane one as well. So the tower is uh, within three, that is one of the interesting things about the Embassy Ruins, is the fact that the control tokens do start within tower range. So therefore, being able to pressure those particular lanes does open up possibilities for the players as these games move forward. Now with the second turn looking over, Ryan is, I believe, contemplating who he's looking for for the next maneuver here. Brovar is a potential option. Vorhild, you may choose to opt until the last round for Ryan. Um, perhaps maybe get a shapeshift on Brovar using the worship action from him. Perhaps a lead action then just to kind of ensure Ryan's right lane against Eric's shenanigans. Obviously, with the positioning of Vorhild, she's very unlikely to go into the right lane for Eric, but for Ryan, Makes perfect sense. Send Vorhild in, go for the attack action, worship in order perhaps to protect her, and also drop that additional pillar down to allow Tlakali to protect the minions in all three lanes. Uh, actually, no, I, I apologize. Uh, as Tlakali is uh, not within three of a pillar anymore, thanks to the Ekrit. So instead, going for the lead from hand also makes sense. Again, knowing Eric preferring that control style of play, not very likely that Vorhild's 13 HP are going to be chewed through very quickly. Um, although perhaps Eric has some surprises planned for us. We shall find out. 
This tournament was started before the sinkhole ban that came through this week, and so therefore sinkhole will make its final appearance during these playoff games here, starting in the next clash, which just started up today on Friday. There will be no more sinkholes. Hallelujah. We love to see it. Listen to the latest episode of Outsiders Only coming out this weekend for more on my thoughts about that. But for now, sinkhole is still a valid play, so we have to watch out for that from both players. Uh, you can check, of course, the description of the video. I did add both of the players' deck lists for your perusal there. And we do see that Eric does respond with the Estrita attack on the minion. Makes perfect sense. Uh, you kill the minion, you spawn a new minion as Estrita, and try to pressure that lane. Using the Vorhild for Eric could potentially be a move, a skirmish into lane number two, the right lane, and then a lead action to kind of help force the issue against Ryan in the left side, in the right side. And we'll see if he goes that route or if he elects to protect against Ryan's rampage in the left lane coming up. As Ryan only has Brovar remaining, Brovar not going to necessarily be able to rampage down the center. Um, would be able potentially to do a move skirmish attack on the minion in the center, but as I mentioned, not really a whole lot of value in doing that, given that both of the lanes are under contest. I would potentially, if anything, suggest maybe sending Brovar into the lane, into the dome. Uh, that does force Vorhild to go into the dome if Eric wants to win it, which would leave some lane pressure available for Ryan. Ryan's Vorhild is leading from the hand, whereas Estrita did not lead, so currently it is a 42 in lane number two. Similarly, Eckert in lane number one over on our left is, did not lead as well. I'm sorry, she did lead, I apologize. So that is a four to, uh, as, again, assuming that everyone is leading with threes, a four to six score. So, okay, there we do see the movement into the dome. This again makes sense. Pres oh, the presence play. Okay, so we have to, let me see if I can do this here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm on an alternate computer from what I normally do, so I apologize. I don't have all of the cards loaded, so we're just going to have to do this the old school way. Presence contributes one extra control value this turn, predict two. So therefore, if Ryan is able to lay a three on the Brovar with a worship action, that's going to make Brovar a value of five, which means that Vorhild must go into the dome in order to stabilize, or Eric concedes the... Terror of the Endless Night Outsider to Ryan, which could have drastic ramifications. So, very intelligent move there from the flex play into presence. Very typical for blue-green opens. Unfortunately, we did not ban presence as well, but, you know, we take the small victories that we can get. As I mentioned on Outsiders Only, Sinkhole being banned is the second greatest news. The only thing better than that, of course, would be if we permanently banned Kenway. And now that we have Kepiax, um, we don't really even need Kenway. So into the trash can you go, where you belong. So Ryan finishing his uh, prediction there. We do see a lead from the deck, of course. Predict 2 is the secondary function of the presence. Looked through his deck, most likely got the 3 uh, that he was looking for, 3 mana. Use that on Brovar, making him worth 5, or potentially could be bluffing. So one of the important things that a lot of people I don't think have experimented with is the art of the bluff. When you lead from the deck after a presence, usually your opponent kind of by default assumes that it is a three mana card. You can use this to kind of over for, or force over commitment as a result, play some mind games. We'll see if that pans out for Ryan. Does Vorhild go into the dome or does Eric say, you know what? I'll concede it round one. I need to stabilize my lanes. He does have the option to pick off the minion in lane number one. With the Vorhild, he could also potentially go for the center. We do see the movement action going over, potentially going for the center. Okay, very nice. So going for that center attack there. Getting a slow push on lane one. We see, oh, the double minus one, but it doesn't matter. Vorhild does enough damage that we're okay with that. And honestly, you want to get those minus ones out of the way early on. Um, again, not that Eric particularly is known for attacking heroes, um, but 
nevertheless. Uh, okay, and then skirmishing into the dome to tie. So this makes good sense here. You win lane three by one, slight tower damage to Ryan in the center. Again, doesn't really mean much in the grand scheme of things right now, but it does get that additional card. Remember, of course, every time you win a control zone, you do get an additional card draw. So early on in the game, we see that each player has three cards left in their hands and everybody's leading with a three. So math occurs. We do see that Ryan wins by two, spawning minions. Eric takes two tower damage, brings him down to three. More minions appear, so very important on Ryan's part there to position those minions to try to minimize the efficacy of the Wind Blast from the Ekrit. So there is a way that Ekrit is able to move next to Tlakali, proceed to Wind Blast. Let's see if Ryan mitigates that by moving Tlakali up two which means that Wind Blast would only be able to affect one, which functionally means there's no point in using Wind Blast. We'll see how that plays out in round number two. Moving over into lane number two, Eric, of course, also secures by one, so able to deal one tower damage point there as well, as both players had their minions removed. The Estrita Charm effect, um, or destroy a minion, spawn a minion, which is functionally speaking a charm effect for the minion coming in very, very useful. So both players now having a little bit of chip damage on their left tower breach priorities. Of course, Ryan having left breach in lane number one does provide him with the momentum advantage because we do resolve them in order. So therefore, even if Ryan were, excuse me, if Eric were to win lane number two sufficiently to destroy the tower, if Ryan is able to also destroy the tower at the end of round two, Ryan will win the game. We also see one more tower damage going in lane number three there. Eric gaining control by one. So going to kind of slow push the lane now there, as you see. We'll see if Ryan chooses to ignore that or if perhaps uh, he decides to mount a counter offensive. And then, of course, we do see that the dome region was tied for both players. Five to five, the use of presence there, very smart by Ryan and we head into round number two. So round number two, the good news for Eric is if you play the presence round number one, you can't play a sinkhole round number two. So Eric does not need to concern himself with possible sinkhole shenanigans, at least during this round. He does, of course, still have to contend with more presences. Ryan has 3x presence. It's very much a staple card. Honestly, probably the second best card in the game behind sinkhole. Just the ability to add plus one control as well as having that additional prediction power. So very versatile, so very useful in the overall strategy planning. So we'll take a look here. Um, both players at near max capacity of hands. Eric, of course, maxed out at seven. Ryan does have six. So both players do have sufficient card draw in order to make a number of good plays here. We'll see what is going to come out as we progress down the line. Of course, Tilakali um, going to, I assume, activate first. No, actually going to leave open the Ekrit play. So Brilvar, ah, Brilvar, no, this makes sense. Yeah, Brilvar should go first there, taunting the Estrita, forcing her to attack him, which means you can't eliminate a minion and then respawn another minion. So we see the move. I assume we'll see the worship action and a lead action. Okay, very nice, there it is. That suggests that perhaps Borhild is going to either shoot there or go into the dome, perhaps. Uh, oh, perhaps we're withdrawing that. Ah, okay, so we're going to go for an attack, not a lead. Okay, that makes sense there. Uh, as well, clearing out the minions, perhaps then Borhild will do the move, lead, worship, or the attack, worship, and lead right where she is. That's perfectly fine. We do see the worship there, shape-shifting himself, meaning that Astrida will be forced to attack unless... Eric is able to whip out a charm and dispel that before Estrita activates. Uh, as Brovar's taunt effect does trigger on the hero's start of activation, which means even after you've charmed it, you will be able to cancel the plus one armor, but you will not be able to cancel the taunted attack. Eric is going with the move action here for the Vorhild. So Vorhild going to defend lane number one. This makes perfect sense. He's got three HP left on the tower. Three more damage, pew, pew, pew. The tower explodes, Ryan wins. And as this is the knockout round of the stage, you don't want to lose the game at the end of round two without a fight. 
Now with the positioning of the minions here, again, the correct choice would be to shoot down the minion that is on the control token. You can have Ekrit move up the, the tile above Tilakali, summon the illusion token above that right now, so essentially two to the left of Nantaka, and then use that to shoot out the two minions that are along the edge of the map. We'll see if Ryan responds by, by moving Tilakali into place, preventing that beforehand. And Eric does go for the correct choice, it looks like. He's hovering over the minion, pings, pings it. Yep, good, that is the correct play there. And we go for the attack action on the flip, plus three and a plus zero. You hate to see the ultimates wasted, but again, dead minion, regaining that control for Eric in the lane. And oh, we actually see the Bewitch card coming out. Very nice. So Bewitch is another kind of the Estrita Charm effect. You defeat a target adjacent friendly minion, and then you spawn another minion. So very good play here as well. What this means now is that uh, that's not a legal spawn point. You have to spawn it next to the control token, but whatever. Um, remember, of course, that minions should always be spawned as close to the control token as possible. So realistically, that minion should have been spawned by the tower, the control hex that is by the tower and the control token. Um, but, you know, as a uh, commentator, we, we've often debated the whether we interfere in gameplay or not, and I think that we long came to the conclusion that it is up to the players due to the fact that not every game is streamed, uh, and so therefore, in order to not create an unfair advantage, um, we've elected that we are observers only. But nevertheless, an excellent play. This also means now that Ekrit does not need to be worried about getting positionally canceled by the Tlakali movement. She can just simply shoot out the minion and then uh, proceed to move or do something else, depending on what Eric feels is appropriate. Actually, now with that being gone, the correct play might be send Eckerd into the dome worship, blasting one of Ryan's minions and the pillar to continue getting control of the center lane, continue getting Ryan to have to think about that. But before that happens, we are going to see the skirmish action from Tlakali. So we see a minus one on the flip. Not a problem there. So now Tlakali, I assume, shoots out one of the minions here. It doesn't really seem beneficial to attack Vorhild. Giving a moment to consider his options here. Worship, also potentially an auction, action that he might want to go for. Um, actually, Worship would be pretty good for Nantaka, getting that ability to deal extra damage with minions, um, being able to prevent minion damage any further, although the last remaining minion for Ryan is currently not able to be protected as they are all all the adjacent tokens, excuse me, all the adjacent hexes are occupied. Oh, and the redirect comes down. Redirect will allow Eric to change the designation of the attack from the minion into Ekrit. Tlakali is not exactly what we think of when we hear big... No, the plus three. Actually, in this case, that's actually pretty good. Plus three onto Ekrit does drop her down to 12, having one armor. So actually not the worst time to redirect. Um, you hate to see the ultimates burned necessarily, but, uh, oh, and another Bewitch. All right, so it is Ryan's turn to Bewitch. So we are going to kill out the minion that was just Bewitched, and then we're going to reposition it. And apparently, okay, so Ryan does spawn it on the control token as he is supposed to. Very good. We see that there. So it is currently two to two. That would have been huge for Ryan had that attack been able to go off. But as it is, lane is currently stable. We do see that... Eric's Vorhild has led, and so therefore Nantaka will need to lead as well in order to maintain some semblance of control. We see the worship token come down there. Does mean that Eckert will be not able to kill both of the minions. Actually speaking, she could there's no way for her to position the token anyways for her illusion to wind blast them. So doesn't need to worry about that in any sense. So Eric is of course going to go after the remaining minion. This does indeed make plenty of sense. We flip the attack action here on that, unless Ryan has 
uh, potentially some kind of shenanigans. I can't imagine what you would do. You can't redirect it with green, blue. Slide, Eckert can still see them unless you double slide her, which would be kind of weird. But potentially worth it. Oh, we got to speak with the spirits. We're going to apply disarm. This is going to be very useful here. So in this case, speak with the spirits. You have two out of three. Prediction, I don't think is going to be used here. So I assume that the shape-shifting ability will be used on Nantaka. Not that that's necessarily going to be needed very much here. It would protect against Eckert's movement effects. But the more important element here is that Eckert is now disarmed, which means this flip is a zero plus flip. Theoretically, given Eric's propensity for stuffing his deck full of high control value, low flip doesn't make a difference though. Um... Why did he flip two? He's attacking with Eckert. Oh, that was Ryan clearing up. Okay, so there it is. Actually, Eric flipping the minus one, meaning that disarm was huge. The minion survives now as Eckert deals negative one damage. Of course, in Sky Tear, we can't deal negative damage, so anything below zero becomes zero. Zero damage to the minion means that that was a very well-executed speak with the spirits there. Now, bringing in the Eckert illusion. So Eckert's illusion will allow her to be safe from any movement generated effects from Ryan. Again, really not looking for that this round necessarily, but perhaps next round when the sinkhole does come online, that will be very useful for Eckert to kind of hold her ground. The next play here, we're going to start the activation. Now Nantaka gets to go. So Nantaka, interestingly enough, with the pillar, could potentially go for some stabby stabby action here. That seems ultimately unlikely Given the context of the situation here, I assume you want to skirmish, damage the Vorhild for plus one, and then move over there and attack the minion. Now, because of the pillar placement here, Vorhild's attack is high enough that a disarm will do nothing, so Ryan doesn't need to worry about a disarm and a minus one. Vorhild, or excuse me, Nenta, on ah, another wasted three. I hate to see it. But nevertheless, minion down. So in this situation here, if we lead with the Nantaka, that does give Ryan a plus one in lane number one. Not enough to continue damaging the tower, but does set him up for a potential turn three play, which is very good. Now, of course, we have to see the response. Given the positions of the heroes, it seems very unlikely that you run Freyhill. All well, actually, Freyhill could get moved, skirmish, and attack the minion. Of course, Ryan would absorb the minion's damage with Tlakali. But... Let's see. Eh, that might be worth the investment, though. If you get Ryan off your case in lane one. But you would also then probably lose pressure in lane two as well. I think the play here for Eric is activate Freyhill. If you have a charm, this is the time to use it. Get that taunt off of Estrita by canceling Brovar's shapeshift ability. I'm not sure... Uh, da, 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 da. Ryan still has his own Vorhild to go. I assume she's going to attack, worship, and lead as Brovar has not led. Hmm. Maybe, let's see. I suppose there's a world case where you have Freyhill shapeshift Estrita anyways and just get a disarm on Brovar so that he's not able to attack. But again, Brovar just kind of wants to move, worship, and lead at this point. So that doesn't necessarily bring you any value of a play. Hmm. I actually don't know what the right play for Freyhill here is. I would say... Actually, there is an argument to be made where you go in, you attack the minion, force Tlakali to drain the damage, and then get control of the dome? No, nah, because that would require two movement actions if you don't have a spell card to do... Some, eh, eh. Yeah, Freyhold's in kind of an awkward spot here. No one's really anywhere close to being nuked, but oh well. All right, so Street is going to go. She's just going to take the taunting effect. Minus one. Brilvar has three armor, so none of that matters anyways. All this theory crafting has been pointless. 
So we're going to see the Estrita attack action. I presume that you probably go for a worship with Estrita. Maybe you worship the Freyhill. Skirmish to reposition, you can go. Okay, we're going for a dome play. Fair enough, as Ryan only does have one hero left. If he has another presence, he could force another draw in the dome. That would be very beneficial um, with this play here. So we'll have to see. Of course, if Eric has his own presence at this time, Eric still does have three cards left. Freyhill has two mana, so it is possible. Excuse me, four cards left. So it is very, very possible for the presence to come out from uh, Freyhill, guaranteeing that Eric gets the dome this time. Let's see what Vorhill does. I feel like you shoot, move into the dome if you have presence, contest, and then lead. If you don't have presence, you shoot the minion, you lead in lane number two, and worship Brova. No, Brova's still Bro uh, worshiped. Worship yourself? I guess that offers you some protection from the terror's abilities since I think all of his abilities are target except for the push roar ability so that would be somewhat useful hmm. let's see what Ryan chooses to do looks like yep we're going for the minion okay so I'm guessing then he probably attacks the minion here we see the flips plus one plus one now, depending on what he has, we'll see either a move worship or a move, or excuse me, a move lead or a lead worship, I believe. As positionally speaking, I think he's fine. Although, there is a use case for putting Vorhild into the cover hex since the terror must spawn in there. Okay, here comes the presence. I have to assume you have a presence, otherwise you just don't do this. What? Okay. Uh, let me think. Why is he doing this? Okay, so... That doesn't make any sense. Because now Freyhill is free to go into the right lane, attack a minion, and then lead. Brovar has not led. The... That... Hmm. That's not necessarily going to spell the end of the game, but that's going to do a lot of damage to Kurito's tower. If Eric has another lead that he's willing to burn, because Estrita gets control of the dome here with the lead, because uh, I'm confident that Eric isn't leading with a colorless card. That's, what, that's going to be one of those we need to follow up at the post-game interview, explain that play, because I do not see the logic behind what Ryan is attempting to do here. Vorhild can't be targeted when she's shapeshifted, but why would you put her in the dome without a lead? Okay, well, let's see what happens here. All right, so Freyhill, I think the correct play for Freyhill is go to lane... Oh, boy. That's why. Okay. Fair enough. So Thorn Roots uh, does make it so that the next time the target adjacent hero, which in this case is Freyhill, would be moved by an effect. That effect is canceled. Of course, Eric is unable to target Vorhild with anything. Uh, so does use the skirmish action. Now the skirmish action does make it so that Eric cannot get within control zone two. Um, so very, very useful effect there. Um, still though you're going to well again yeah at this point I don't even think you attack the minion I think you just leave because then you can yeah you just do you deal more tower damage because Tlakali would absorb the damage anyways so now you just lead and do a ton of damage to Ryan's central tower uh, Brilvar did not lead, so that's going to actually result overall in a win for Ryan. Uh, Ryan currently has three to Eric's one in lane number two, so interesting series of events here. 
doing the math, uh, we're going to see what happens here. So we do see the lead from the hand in the end. So probably two or three. Again, not going to be enough to destroy the tower necessarily, but it will. Oh, Eckward only led with a two. So Nantaka leads with a three there. Interesting. So this might actually do one more tower damage, I think. Yeah. So that deals one more damage to the tower. That tower is now down to two. Uh, and that does respawn two more minions for Ryan. And this is very dangerous for Eric now. Um, obviously, he does get control of the Terror of the Endless Night. Needs to make strong use of that Terror. So with the Terror, he's not going to be able to do anything to... Oh, Nantaka's Shapeshift came off. That's right. Yeah, that was done before. And so actually, yeah, he can move Nantaka as she is no longer shapeshifted. Now, Ryan does get a little bit of pressure release in lane number two. Again, the control token is not moved far enough so that he, that Eric can't re-damage it starting in turn three, but there are four minions on the field now, making that significantly more difficult. Resolution here in the center uh, with the Frey Hill, or excuse me, with, with yes, with the Frey Hill, we do see quite a bit there. I believe it should be a three. Yep. So that is a seven to two lead there. So that is five. So we will kill two minions and the tower stands with one hit points. Okay. So the tower is still alive. Like GLaDOS, the tower is still alive. Now, that being said, Eric has quite a substantial amount of damage. Boy, if only we could play the new explosive damage card, you just blow up the tower that's on one hit point and voila, Nexus exposed, start threatening Nexus destruction, Ricardo would be proud. But unfortunately, we don't have the untamed cards yet, no explosive damage, so Carito's center does protect him at least one more turn there. Now we get to see the Terror of the Endless Night come forth. So let's go ahead, take a look at our outsider of choice here. The Terror of the Endless Night, as I said before, does have to spawn inside of a cover hex, which are the silhouette outlined hexes that we see scattered around the map. The Nightmarish Roar, as I suggested earlier, was an area effect where we push each hero one hex and then apply the slow to them. Could be very useful in a control style game. Dreadful Majesty, place target hero adjacent and disarm. Very useful for perhaps throwing Nantaka into the dome, pushing her uh, and slowing her with them with the follow-up knife uh, roar. And then Bloodlust, apply Frenzy to target adjacent enemy hero. That particular effect, not as valuable here in a control game. In a kill game, aggro game, much more effective to give that Frenzy effect. So let's see how Eric opts to make use of this. So again, both players getting two cards from the control token victory draws going to have six cards going into round three where we're going to have the sinkholes flying left and right. We hate to see it, but you know, it is what it is, as they say. So now Eric has to decide, where do I spawn the outsider? I think the correct play is put it into lane number one. Um, just because you can then, as I mentioned, you can deal with Nantaka uh, a little bit easier. You can also potentially deal with Tlakali. That is also an option. Um, you could also get Brovar, throw him in lane number two. I'm not sure that that's the most efficient use of the Outsider. You could also use that and then push... Vorhild a little bit further back in the dome. That's also an option. Obviously, Vorhild's shapeshift protects her from targeted attacks. Nightmarish Roar is an AoE, which is not protected. Um, hmm. What else would we do here? Um, yeah, this is what I thought was going to happen. So, Endless, or the Terror of the Endless Night does grab the Tlakali. That makes sense. Get her away from the talent tokens. Make it so that she can't really protect the minions. Although, I don't think there's any... Oh, yeah, you can, you can push her back one uh, more row there. 
So we're going to attack Nantaka. All right, fair enough. You don't really have any other options for what you can do there. Three damage to Nantaka puts her to 15. Again, Eric not likely to go for damage uh, on these heroes, so not a surprise to see a little bit of chip damage. I'm sure that Kurito is not worried at all. And then it looks like we have the push effect from the terror going to slow to Lakali, um, making her of limited use. She has been disarmed from the grab swing from the first effect, and then she was slowed by the push effect as well. So is possible to potentially change this around um, with the thousandth ritual. I didn't see which of Ryan's threes he flipped earlier in the game. So if he's able to play the Tlakali Ultimate, uh, which allows you to apply uh, conditions to everyone within line of sight of Tlakali or a pillar, is completely possible to make it so that she can kind of change things around a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, the ultimates for these heroes... Nantaka's Call of the Queen might be useful here for Ryan. Vorhild's, eh, it's okay. Brovars would be helpful if he wants to knock some of the heroes around a little bit. You can just keep repeatedly shoving them and adding that slow condition, perhaps bully Estrita all the way back to Eric's side of the map. Um... Let me think what else here. Vorhild's, eh, not so good. Now on the other side, of course, Eric also has the Frey Hill, which is the global heal. Again, not so great here. There's not a whole lot of hero damage going on. Not very useful. Estrida's ultimate, of course, always useful. You get to cancel an entire enemy activation with the Song of the Siren. The Ekrit Alt Windblast, actually very, very potent. If with the token position right now, Windblast would destroy two minions. So it is very much possible to get rid of several of those. So let's see what we have. All right, so we're going to get rid of that illusion. Very good choice. I agree with that. Right off the bat, stop the Ekrit from doing anything weird. Or do we just play Eye of the Storm right now before Ryan has a chance to get rid of it? Eric is on a full hand of cards here. Nope, gonna let it go through. Dead Eckert Illusion. So that does allow her to be moved. So the sinkhole play is now a possibility, but we're gonna go ahead and do the Bewitch play instead. We've seen Bewitch before, of course. This allows us to kill off one of Eric's minions and transform it into one of Ryan's minions. So with this play here, actually very, very potent. If Ryan is able to prevent Vorhild from doing the same for Eric puts him in a very, very strong position for the end of turn resolution. Now, of course, with Nantaka spending two mana, that's going to require Tlakali to get back into lane. Could do that with a skirmish action. Um, actually, no, never mind. There, It is possible to grab Vorhild right now with a sinkhole play, but of course... If Eric uses defeat on the minion to Vorhild's right, that is in between her and the Terror of the Endless Night, the sinkhole positioning from Tlakali's current positioning would be such that it's impossible to get Vorhild away from the minion. So it does need to move Tlakali over a little bit more in order to get that effect. Ryan looks like he's taking a second to contemplate the next moves. Um, I feel like the play here, you might want to worship. You might want to lead. Obviously, you don't want to move Nantaka out of this lane. You're kind of hard committed to left breach being your victory condition. You've staved off the right breach for now. Tamer isn't really a thing. Eric's blowing down your middle lane there. So you need to make a play and you need to make it now. I think that this is probably Ryan's best chance for winning is the left breach condition. I would not be surprised if we see 
Uh, let me see. One, two, three. Now, Vorhild actually cannot make it. That last cover hex is still part of the middle lane territory. Unless we did something really weird with the sinkhole that would move her over, you could do that. Um, that would actually be a ridiculously good use, but okay. We're bringing out the chasm. This is going to be the big card once sinkhole has been banned. Uh, so we do see the chasm, target a hex within two, push each hero adjacent, and we see the response, Amulet of Immovability, which means that you cannot be generate, uh, moved by effects generated by enemies and also draw a card. Very important. So Eric was attempting to... No! God, I hate this card. Here comes the sinkhole. So... Sinkhole, place AoE on target hex within two hexes. You may move each hero one hex, and then they must end these movement effects in the AoE. I hate this card. I'm glad it's banned. The game is going to be so much healthier without this garbage card. Thank God we're getting rid of it. Hallelujah. Um, again, you are about to see the power of the sinkhole. There is really nothing that... Wait a minute. If Eric pings there... Vorhild, or excuse me, a, a, a Kali could technically stop Vorhild with her own sinkhole, placing the target for the sinkhole from Ryan on the hex that's with the Terror of the Endless Night, and then placing the, right there where Ryan's cursor is on the um, cover hex dome, you could get it and arrange the sinkhole AoE that would actually cancel so let's see, does Ryan have the sinkhole response? Or literally anything else? Nope, he does not. Okay, so. We're going to drop down the sinkhole AoE. Oh no, it's not. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we do see, so Nantaka is trapped within that dome. She's going to get moved over there. Ekrit's going to slide right over. Makes sense. Make it so that she can't get back um, to do any further shenanigans. Although she's already, Nantaka has already attacked. And so therefore doesn't really make a difference. Um, it does actually matter for Tal Wait. No. Ryan. No, no, no. Okay. This is much better. Okay. So now we're going to kick uh, Ekrit over to the Far Hex and then Nantaka back to where she was originally. That makes good sense there. Um, due to the fact then that that does leave a room for Tlakali to get over into the left lane with the... Sc oh my god, and Freyhill brings out a sinkhole. Oh, I can't wait until the Clash. I'm going to cast every Clash game I can just because I know that Sinkhole is no longer a thing. So, the Sinkhole comes down once again. This Sinkhole is going to force Tlakali to move. Um, does Chasm... Oh yeah, Chasm is within two. I never played Chasm, so I have, I have to look these cards up to see what they do. So this Sinkhole is now going to drag Tlakali, presumably towards the center of the right lane. You hate to see it. Unless Ryan drops a chasm himself from the Vorhild and kicks Freyhill over into lane. I guess you can just kick her down one into the heavily brushed cover hex. Is there a response? from Ryan. Do we see anything? It has to be Vorhild. I guess Brovar could actually... Oh, God. Here we go again. Bringing out the AoEs. Trapping it down. Tilakali is going to get moved. This is going to make it so that she has 0% chance of being able to make it into lane 1. Very good defensive play by Eric. Um, bemoanings of the garbageness of sinkhole aside very good use eric showing very much why this card has been at the top of the sky tear competitive gameplay for pretty much this game's entire existence which is going on three years now the movement effect the trapping effect so so powerful so we now see 
Vorhild moving over. And the stack has finally been cleared. So 20 minutes later, the stack is cleared. There is no way we're getting into lane number one over there. Um, that hurts. That hurts Ryan a lot. So now, uh, Eric actually has a very interesting opening where he can potentially just siege the middle. Freyhill is already in position. I think you use Estrida to pretend, uh, potentially maintain control over lane number three. Nantaka has not led, and there's no chance for Ryan to get into lane number one. And so Eric doesn't lose lane number one unless he makes a huge misplay. That being said, half the board is now out of mana. All right, Nantaka is going to lead, so that does make sense. Um, Ryan does, of course, still have four minions, so all hope is not totally lost. It is still possible for Ryan to win a small amount in lane number one. Not enough to deal any tower damage with two minions alive. There's no way to get within three of the... Actually, never mind, no. So the Kali can actually get in range with a skirmish. Um, and so can actually shoot the one minion. She can't influence the lane number one directly. But because there are no white lines between the lanes, it is actually possible for Tlakali to skirmish into the cover hex that is below the Terror of the Endless Knight, shoot the minion, either one really doesn't make a difference, and then lead to... Oh, wait, lead, yeah, uh, but then if you do that, then you're not able to help lane number three. That's kind of a waste. I guess you could move and then just provide one control power to lane number three. That might be an option. But the good news is, everybody on Eric team, Eric's team except for Estrita is out of mana. Which means... Really no more counterplay. Sinkhole, they're both exhausted, so that's done with. Now, the question does become, does Estrita have Song of the Siren? If she does, we may see some unfortunateness coming out for Estrita singing the Song of Despair and nullifying somebody's turn. Now, obviously, she can't target uh, Vorhild right now, given that Vorhild is shapeshifted, but you can still target Brilvar minimizing his overall effectiveness. Eric carefully considering his options here. Again, as I mentioned, Eric is a huge fan of the slow, measured gameplay. Has brought him a lot of success over the years. Excuse me, very much a proponent of the, the measured gameplay. Uh, in starch opposition to those of us that like to go in and go murder hobo style, um, swing, flip, and you're dead. The correct way, in my opinion, to play this game. So we're going to go ahead and activate. Now Freyhill is going to go. She's going to attack the pillar, interestingly enough, making it so that Ryan will have to burn worship actions in order to reestablish defense against those minions. We then see the lead action and the worship. Does the worship go on Estrita? I would assume so. Yes, and there we go. So presumably we put that in lane number two, I guess. Um, lane number one, I feel like you've got a strong enough lead. And given the fact that the tower explodes here, Ryan won't get any minion reinforcements at the end of the round. So I feel like putting a Strita in there is just overkill. Let's see what the next play is. Now, Brilvar, Tlakali can still, again, still move. Now, Tlakali, again, is disarmed and slowed as well. The slow is annoying. The disarm actually could potentially be fatal. Ryan did not bring necessarily quite as control of a deck, still a control-oriented deck for this particular matchup. So we'll have to take a look and see exactly what plays out here. So it is still possible for him to fail that attack, just like Eric did with Eckert earlier, with the zero plus on the flip, if he tries to shoot out one of the minions with Tlakali. 
Can't use the Thousandth Ritual anymore, as I suggested earlier. Takali has exhausted her mana. Let's see what the play is. I assume we leave Brolvar for later at this point, just due to the fact that you may want to use Avalanche to reposition Brolvar and or one of Eric's heroes, perhaps knock Freyhill out of control range. Again, Astrida with the yellow blue mana doesn't really have a whole lot of movement effects. Obviously it could be another chasm. That would be kind of disgusting if Eric had two chasms and two sinkholes uh, locked and loaded. But, oh wait, hold on. No, that was Ryan's sinkhole, my, or excuse me, chasm, my apologies. Um, still would be disgusting if Eric had that many movement cards in his hand, but nevertheless. So with that being said now, it is Ryan's turn waiting to see. It looks like he's considering Vorhild, potentially for the play. Vorhild, uh, Vorhild's kind of in a weird spot. Um, hmm. Let's see what we've got here. All right, we're going to start the activation. We're going to go with Vorhild, though. So Vorhild drops the shapeshift, goes for the move action, goes for the attack. There is no counterplay here unless... Uh, nope, because Estrita can't target the... Ah, okay, the Dreams of Talit. So Dreams of Talit does allow you to remove a friendly pillar from the battlefield and then place another pillar on a target hex that does not already contain a token or a mini. So this will allow a reestablishment of protection. I assume we move, if we're going to remove a token, um, we're putting one down there. Why is he putting the pillar down there? If you had topple, that might make sense. Nope. Okay. Okay, looks like we're putting that in the coverage. That makes more sense. So now Tlakali does have the within three ability. She's able to protect the minions. That makes more sense. We're going to go for the skirmish action now. So we're going to go into the dome. I assume then we're going to lead here. Yep, makes sense. So Ryan trying to get control of the terror, realizing that we might need a little bit of a tempo change that the outsider is capable of bringing. And so then going to force a uh, potential response here. Now... The interesting thing to note is Ekrit could win Barrier Vorhild into lane 3. You move Ekrit on top of the control token, you place the worship in between Vorhild and the blue minion, and then you just win Barrier. Not sure that Eric would necessarily want to do that because that would then, well, yeah, no, because you you have Freyhill leading in lane three, um, so lead cancel lead minions, overwhelming, bada bing bada boom, tower still explodes, so that that could potentially be a value play there, um, and then you can just lead with Vorhild as Eric, Takali not going to get into the lane number one with that barricade set up. Uh, let's think. What else can we do here? Hmm. You could, of course, again... Oh, no, never mind. She's out of mana. She can't do that. Yeah, I think the move... Worship, Wind Barrier, Vorhild out of the dome might be the best value play for Eckert. You can't set it up so that you can Wind Barrier both of Ryan's minions. Again, obviously, Takali would just drain the damage anyways, but um, you can't even set that up, so you can't even make that as an option there. Or, oh, here's a play. Do you Wind Barrier Nantaka? and get control of lane number one. That's an option as well. That might be the play there. That actually might be the play move. Well, definitely not the play now as Ekrit is uh, moving up there. So that's not going to be the option. We're going to attack and kill the minion there. 
Vorhild, of course, out of mana, so not going to be able to do anything. We see another plus three. So I think at this point, likely that Eric has flipped the Song of the Siren. And we're going to go for the lead action. That makes perfect sense. Hmm. So yeah, I think that Eckert's play, Wind Barrier out the Vorhild potentially. You can now move Eckert in between the minion and Vorhild, place the token in lane number three and still Wind Barrier Vorhild into lane number three out of the dome. That's an option. Eric may also just choose to shoot out the minions. Um, Oh wait, Nantaka shapeshifted. I did not. I did not recognize it. Never mind. Okay, yeah. So we couldn't have. We couldn't have wind barriered Nantaka in the first place. Um, I missed that one. So can't do that. Uh, so yeah. So I think moving Vorhild is the is the option there. The best play. All right. We see Brovar move lead worship. What a surprise! So we're gonna force the Estrita attack on Brovar again. Very good call by Ryan, forcing the Estrita to waste her effect uh, effect on Brovar. Whoop de doo, Brovar becomes disarmed if there was any chance the damage goes through. Um, but not able to really do a whole lot. Brovar does not really care about being disarmed. He's just trying to stop the minions from going from blue to red orange. Now, Brovar does still have three mana left, so and Ryan does have two cards left in hand, so it is potentially possible that we see more movement shenanigans from the Estrella. I assume that you activate Eckert here as Eric. Because I feel like you want to keep a street off for the last. But I'm not sure. <sighs> hmm. That might be a play. Regardless, we'll see what happens here as we move on. Um, taking a look now at the kind of state of the board in general. Reminder again, of course, that the victory conditions, right breach, left breach, Ryan does have priority in lane number one currently. But that may be changing this round with Eric's Great Wall of Defense using the Outsider, using Ryan's own hero, and then the crippling slow effect from the Terror of the Endless Night Outsider. Uh, so we'll go ahead and see how this plays out. Obviously, Ryan still does have Tlakali. What Tlakali does here, I think, is going to be critical. She is obviously out of mana, so she can't play any cards. But there is still plenty of space left to affect, affect the overall state of the board. Hmm. Uh, what else can we do here? And this is one of those points where we get to where Sky Terror is a butterfly effect game, hands down. You know, oftentimes when you go through the game, if you think through your, the games that you've won or lost, you often think, you know, was that one play, that one hex that I stepped into the wrong play, that card played at the wrong time, was that what set the tempo that ultimately led to my defeat or my victory? All right, finally, we're getting some action. Thank God. I was running out of things to say, as I'm sure you guessed. So we have Estrita going for the activation. We then see the immediate response from the Brovar taunt, the disarm coming through from the attack. Again, Brovar could not care less. 
going for the skirmish action. So where does Estrita go? Does she go into lane? Yeah, okay, this makes perfect sense. We're gonna reapply pressure here. Ryan does have the four minions, but an Estrita lead here does allow Eric to potentially restabilize that. He does have three plus whatever the lead is. With a two, he regains control. And now, finally, the last activation, Chilakali. So let's see, Takali is gonna go for the move. Does she go down? Okay, so she's gonna move over there. Um, one, two, th does she skirmish? Targeting Eckert, okay, fair enough. Ah, that, oh, that's a movement hex you can go to. That makes perfect sense. Okay, so Takali actually could get into lane one. I did not realize that. That, right, right, I saw Ryan try to drop a pillar there. That actually makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, the minus one does prevent the minion death, so um, unfortunate there, but Tlakali is at least able to contribute to the control zone. Now, Ekrit, on the other hand, gets to activate. So from that positioning, Ekrit could attack a minion in lane number one, which she might actually want to do at this point. Let's see, the current the current count status here, I believe there are four minions plus whatever Nantaka has plus Tilakali. Let's assume a three. So Ryan has up to eight. Eric has one, two, Vorhild is led, so we'll assume six, seven. So if we use Ekrit to pop a minion, theoretically assuming both players led with threes, that results in a stalemate in lane number one, which would stabilize the lane for Eric, getting him more minions, making it harder for Ryan to clear out could be an option there for Eric to kind of just reposition accurate a little bit. Um, see what happens here. Looks like that's what we're doing. We're going to attack the minion. Dead minion. Oh, could. Oh, no, no. Eckert's out of mana. Never mind. Uh, that was a street that had leftover mana. So, dead minion. Um, I assume you just worship and move. Maybe move into the cover hex to hide from the terror. Because Ryan's going to get the outsider this turn. Um, hmm. <sighs> yeah. I, I mean, with Vorhild already leading, there's not a whole lot for Eckert to do, really. I guess, yeah. I mean, yeah. Worship, yep. Bring that control token down so that Eckerd at least can't be moved. Maybe put her in the cover hex to hide her so it's uh, impossible for the terror to disarm her without wasting movement action. I guess that's what you do. Lead action. Okay, well, lead from the deck. Maybe he's trying to cycle his deck, I guess? Or perhaps the Voiled was a bluff. Uh, so let's go ahead then and resolve. So lane number one should, by math, be a tie. Let's see if we can catch everybody's numbers as they pop up here, because I don't really want to scroll. Seeing for any end of turn plays. Doesn't look like there is anything, of course. All right, so leads from the end. Nantaka three, Eckert three, Vorhild three. Okay, yeah, so I don't, I guess we're just trying to burn the deck, I assume. Um, so that should result in Ryan winning by one, so the minion does die. How did I miscount? Oh, because I accidentally counted one of Eric's Ryan's, so I messed them up. Okay, so Ryan does win by one. Um, no tower damage, but does continue to grow that minion count. We do see the token actually not really positioned well there to win barrier away minions, but oh, minions are going for the fist bump and everything's going wrong. The TTS physics engines are going to have a field day, um, but this does make it more difficult now for Ryan to secure as there are three minions for Eric in lane number one. Two heroes are over there, Eckert, Vorhild, Eckert, again, Eh, it depends on where that terror goes. Actually, you could make a use case where you line Eckerd up and wind barrier the minions away. Um, but over in lane number two, I missed those because I was yammering too much, but it is a Strita. I assume it's probably a three. So 
Mathing is occurring. One minion dies. Should be a second if it was. Oh, hold on. All right, we're gonna peek. No, that's not peeking. Wrong control. Uh, oh, Street only led with a two. Okay, so that gives her a total of five. So it would be one minion dead. Um, control token does advance by one, like so. And now we have a lot more minions. So, but again, Ryan has four minions in lane number two. So. Very solid defense, although, of course, a good Bewitch card and some Astrida charming effects could rapidly turn the tides, but there's four points of damage on the tower, so unless there is a lot of charming, which, to be fair, we are going into round number four for mana, uh, could be done. I don't see that tower exploding. Now, however, the middle here, boom, boom, kaboom, that tower is way gone. Nexus is exposed in lane number three now. Um, Ryan no longer gets minions, so Ryan has to react here. If Ryan does not end the game, it is very likely that he just loses here. Honestly, as Eric, I feel like you stabilize lane one, and then you just go all in on lane three. Um, because Ryan absolutely must respond here. You aren't going to lose anything to... Lane number two, you've moved the control hex more than three units away from your tower, so we're fine there. Hmm. Terror of the Endless Night coming out for Ryan now, though. So we are going to drop this right there, I guess. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Vorhild is not shapeshifted, so she could be grabbed. We are going to attack the Eckert Illusion. I like that call. Good call there. Get rid of that before Eckert does something weird. Now grab her and throw her. Excellent. Moving her down there. Putting the slow and the disarm on her as well. Have a taste of your own medicine. How do you like it? Um, going to make it a little bit more difficult. And because of the minion positioning, even Wind Barrier is not going to be as effective getting the minions. Um, get, based on positioning, it is going to be... Well, you could get two. I guess you could move Eckerd up one, Worship down behind the Terror, and then Wind Barrier, all three of them. That could be a potential play for Eric there as well. But would require... Oh! Whoa. Okay, hold on. Who's playing what here? Okay, we're discarding cards. I was going to say, I was like, wait a minute, why are we whipping out slides and Vorhild's Oath and all this crazy stuff before we've started the next round? All right, so we are into round four. Could be the final round. Um, you know, we're still at a reasonably controlled board state here. Um, I feel like the game should end this round. Eric obviously has the Nexus Tower exposed. Um, Ryan has some level of pressure on lane number one. Um, so, theoretically, you know, that could be a thing, question mark? Hmm. Let me think on this. What else can we, what can we set up for here? All right, well, if Ryan has selected Tlakali to go first, potentially looking for a setup for a good Thousandth Ritual. Actually, yeah, I mean, Eckert's already crippled. There's not really anything you can do to Vorhild. She has three plus on the, well, yeah. I mean, if you flip a minus one, on, yeah, it's unlikely to flip two minus ones on an attack, though. Um, yeah. Not sure if I like that play. Um, yeah, Thousandth Ritual here 
doesn't seem to... Ooh, actually, though. Well, actually, Thousandth Ritual could be used to apply Frenzy to Nantaka, and then we could just go and try to nuke the Vorhill. That could be a potential thing. All right, so anyways, before we go to that, Takali is going to go for the attack action. We're going to shoot a minion. If Eric whips out another sinkhole, I'm going to scream. Don't do it. Don't you dare bring that sinkhole, sir. Don't do it. I'm warning you. Don't you dare show me sinkhole. Although Eric does seem to be taking a little bit of time, so there is some... Oh, okay, okay. New cards, we like to see it. Endless Disciples. We get to choose two. Spawn a friendly minion or place target friendly adjacent minion next to another minion on the battlefield. And up to two friendly minions cannot be defeated. Um, which is kind of wild. So, I assume that we're going to use the spawn a friendly minion and the up to two target minions cannot be defeated effects. That seems to be the likely cause here, so I assume you're going to protect those minions and then spawn another one. You could um, just further cripple Ryan's ability to win in lane number one. Does Ryan have a response? We, we have a rules question. Oh, great. We're asking me for rules. This ought to be good. And and your decision is final, even if it's wrong, RG. Oh, God, the pressure. All right, let's hit, hit me. So when he plays Endless Disciples, mm -hmm. is, is, he, is he supposed to choose the two modes now? And oh. then if he chooses the two modes, does he also target now? Uh, shoot. I think Tape said you choose on resolution. So there is, there's no chance to respond to targeting them? I don't think so, right. which is weird, right? Because I, I had the same problem with the... Uh, Wait, no, 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 hold on. Hold on. Yeah, 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 hold on. Yeah, because I was actually thinking, I think I had that wrong. Yeah, because Tape did mention with the speak with the spirits, if you can't, you target and then you can cancel out the target. So yeah, there, yeah, he has to declare now. Okay. Uh, I must have gotten it wrong. Cool. Thank you very much. Did you, de you declare them and then you also target now? Yeah, he well, yeah, yeah. He has to pick and then declare the targets. I'm I'm fairly certain that's how it works. Until tape yells at me later and says, "No, that's not how it works." <laughs> no, that's well, fine. Well, you say it's fine, even if you're wrong. <laughs> Great. Thank you much. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so clearly we are going after those effects for the targeting. Um, again, I apologize. That's one of the things about Sky Terror is there's a bunch of weird little interactions um, that sometimes don't always come up in 100% of the use cases. Um, I don't play blue green personally, as I've you know clearly established over my time here. Violence is the best answer for this game, uh, so I mostly know the red yellows and then a couple of the green cards with sinkhole. So looks like we're going to protect those two minions there. Um, did we choose to spawn another minion as well? What was the, or did we move the minion? Place target friendly adjacent minion to another. Yeah, okay, so that wouldn't necessarily be beneficial here. Hmm. Okay, we are going to spawn the minion. That makes sense. Yeah, just continue piling that stuff in there. And just further cripple Ryan's ability to respond. All right, we see the plus one. Uh, again, the minions are protected from the attack thanks to the Endless Disciples. So no damage there. Um, mm, rapidly starting to look like this is going to end up being Eric's game here. Tilakali isn't really able to... Well, I guess she could move and skirmish around and then get within the range of Control Token 3, but... Eric currently has, what is that, seven minions in lane three, plus his Frey Hill. I feel like with that many minions and last activation and the positioning of Ekrit. Well, again, though, of course, Ekrit being disarmed means that she could flub the wind barrier. Um, 
Oh, denied though. No, 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 Ryan, that's where you want to stick that. That's how you protect your, there you go. Very nice. Okay, so that's where the wind barrier, uh, or excuse me, the illusion for the wind barrier would have needed to go for Eric, given that his Ekrit is crippled. So that was actually a very good play there, um, preventing that and going for the lead action. I agree with this. I think Ryan's best chance here to win is commit and then use the fact that lane number one resolves before lane number three and just try to brute force this. Um, I, th I think that any other option and Eric is just going to kind of stalemate you and then blow up lane number three. So... Yeah, I think I think that if Ryan has a sinkhole or a chasm, Brilvar's positioning does allow for some defensive play. You can move, uh, and then let me see, move and you know you can't get in there with a move and skirmish. Um, you can move skirmish, putting Brilvar on the edge of the middle lane, but still in position where he can at least push Freyhill and Astrida back from lane number one, kind of limiting. Eric's ability to influence lane number one. And then try to just funnel his other three heroes, Vorhild, Nantaka, and uh, Tlakali, into that brute forcing ability. And if that doesn't work, then Eric just wins because the Nexus is going to explode. So, Tlakali's turn is ended, so it is now Eric's turn. If I'm Eric, I think I... Eh, what do I do, actually? Eh, I feel like I get... Do I use Ekrit? Because she's already crippled. Okay, looks like we do. We're going to worship. We're going to... We're going to... What? Okay, I mean, I guess this allows Ekrit to get in. That's fair. Um, not... Well, actually, no, it doesn't. Nantaka is shapeshifted. That's not going to do anything, sir. Okay, yeah. Eric does see it. Okay, good. Um, no, that's, that's not, no, yeah, this, this is, this is, uh, oh, no, 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 Eric, no, this was not the play, sir. Okay, we're going to skirmish. Yeah. And then I guess you attack regularly? Wait, that's not in lane number one. Why are we leading? That's not in lane one, right? I have to zoom in on this. No, that's, yeah, you're in, you're, hmm. Now that's a wasted action. Um, Why would you not shoot the minion on the control token? There's no pillar protecting it. Huh. Okay. Well, it is what it is, I suppose. Um. Hmm. Unless, is he setting up for some weird play later? Like, are we setting up for some kind of 4D play where we wait for Nantaka's shapeshift to fall off, drop the wind barrier, and then chasm Ekrit in somehow? Or not the wind barrier, Eye of the Storm? Hmm. That would be, like, ridiculously convoluted, but also really funny to watch. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen. Hmm. I'm perplexed. 
Uh, let's see. Nantaka is going to go. All right, cool. So let's see what this does. Okay, attacks the minions. Lots of plus plus. Disarm doesn't do anything. Chasm could... No, Chasm can't fix that. Um, because you're... No, the, no, the redirect card, though. Oh, God, okay. This is actually going to hurt the outsider. Um, didn't think we'd need this, but we're, here we go. Um, this is actually going to do a lot of damage to the outsider, unless Ryan has a way to re-redirect this, which I don't think he does, because I don't think green-blue does. Nope. So, this is actually going to be a lot of damage to the Outsider, but that and $5 will get you a small coffee at Starbucks. Uh, and this is also actually going to get you the Outsider is going to get a retaliatory swipe. Which... Do you move the outsider into the dome? I don't even know what you would do as the counter. I guess Ryan could sinkhole his Nantaka into the cover hex, or we can just use shield slam. Also an option. Wait, why are we shield slamming the illusion? At... Okay. Eckert can now be moved. Sure. Shield slam. Um, wait. Nantaka doesn't have armor. That should have done zero damage. Hold up. Oh, no. Takali played. Never mind. Okay, I'm sorry. Takali had one armor. That's fine. Okay. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so we have that. Okay, so now we're going to kick... Okay, so this makes sense here. So the Chasm play now is going to push Nantaka into the... Oh my god, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> okay. Um, well then. So, the plan was to kick Nantaka into the cover hex to make it so that Redirect would not be able to target her. Um, but Eric says, no, we're just going to redirect that into the middle of nowhere. So a Chasm opens up. The minions are able to tap dance around it because they aren't affected. It would technically push Vorhild, but because minions are not affected by the chasm effects, Vorhild is going to stay right where she is. And so now we're going to attack the terror for a lot of damage. Um, six, seven, plus, plus. I have to remind myself, is it all minions or just... Friendly minion, okay. In line of sight of her target. Okay, so that's how I always forget how that works. Okay, no, it's inside of her target, so that would only be one, two, three. Okay, so five plus plus. Not terrible, but again, either way, we're not killing the outsider. It's just not happening, so. It is what it is, I suppose, as they say. Um, kind of tragic, but, you know. Okay, we're removing the cards from the stacks here, so the redirect resolves, the chasm resolves, and now the redirect forces the attack onto the outsider. So Eric will get the retaliation effect. It'll be interesting. We can choose to attack Nantaka, skirmish against Nantaka, or move. We'll be interesting to see what he elects to choose as... Eckert has already activated, um, which means you can't really move her into lane number two by moving the outsider out of the way. That would have been an interesting play to see. We see the plus one. So four damage to the outsider, eh, whatever. Again, doesn't really make that much of a difference. We're not trying to kill the outsider. But Eric does get a retaliation action. Uh, one of the, probably one of the best rule changes that we had in Season 2. Obviously, for those of you who have been here for a long time, remember Season 1, where we had Hunting for Power, and the Outsider not retaliating just 
allowed you to gang up and blow them up instantly, which is kind of annoying. We changed those rules. So now we're gonna move into lane number two. So that's reasonable. The control hex with the pillar into it is part of lane number one. Brovar could move skirmish and then movement effect himself into there. Vorhild could also go in there, but overall does create some sort of a blocking um, element. I guess Eric's play next might be... Eh. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. All right, so both Nantaka and Tlakali are leading, of course. Still vulnerable to the carousel of the sinkhole play. You can't drop that token on a mini's hex, sir. That's not how that works. That's a valid spot. Put it down. Drop it. Freeze, soldier. Any day now. Put it down. I don't really think it matters. I guess technically, you, yeah, whatever. Throw it down. All right, cool. So we have a random pillar in the middle of nowhere. If we had an unburial rights card to play, that would be pretty big. We could cause a lot of momentum flip with that. Uh, but alas, such is life. And burial rights kind of seem a little bit problematic. It costs too much for what it does. Uh, and so overall, really not used in these particular games. All right, so Freyhill is going to go. Freyhill is going to move. Freyhill is going to skirmish. She's going to go ahead and lock up that lane one spot. I assume we're going to attack. Makes perfect sense. So Kali is out of mana. Nantaka does have full mana, and there comes an Endless Disciples. Here we go again. So I assume we're going... Oh, excuse me. I assume we're going to protect those two minions right there. That makes sense. And then I assume we're going to spawn one more minion there. Throw that. It doesn't really matter where, because Ekret's already gone, so we don't really need to worry about Wind Blast coming down. Or Wind Barrier, excuse me coming down and deleting minions in a line. Okay, so that's going to cancel the attack. Freyhill is in lane number one now. Leaving lane number three exposed for the time being. Um, very interesting play here. Again, Eric just simply needs to have enough control power in lane one that the tower doesn't explode and then lane three resolves and he wins because the nexus only has five hp and there are currently seven minions in that lane so freyhill is going to concede the round brilvar or nantaka for ryan um hmm. Hmm, 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 hmm. the decisions to be made Let's think. Without a Bewitch card, I I think Ryan's in trouble. Because, again, the minion pressure in lane two is whatever. Actually, nah, Shrita, well, hold on a minute. If a Shrita worships, converts a minion, that makes it five, four minions to three minions, and then leads. That nah, that's not enough to destroy the tower. Never mind. Ryan has enough minions. Although if she double if she double bewitches, that would be enough to end the game. Alright, let's see. Ryan is gonna I assume go for the move taunt. Yeah, okay. So we're gonna move here, we're gonna to lead, and then we're going to taunt. Not saying that it's necessarily enough because Astrida could still, again, play those Bewitch cards and then lead. And that would give quite a bit of power. But the Brovar leading would, I think, be sufficient to at least prevent tower destruction in lane number two. 
The problem is lane three is also now exposed and Ryan has to send Vorhild there or it's GG's. All right, so there we go. We see the lead action followed by the worship to finish the round. Makes perfect sense there. Eric's turn. Eric is going to go with the Estrita. So Estrita is going to go for the attack on the Brovar once again, shooting into the Porcupine's Hide. No damage is going to occur, or at least very little. If she flips a three, that'll be two damage, but no shapeshift on this play, so no disarm for Brovar. Again, Brovar doesn't really care about that at all, so this is really just a formality of the cycle, so we flip the card. We flip the card, we shuffle the deck, then we flip the card, plus zero, yeah. So bounces off the hardened scales of the Pangolian, or the Porcupine, whatever you want to call him. Technically a Pangolian, but I think he looks like Sonic the Hedgehog, so we're going to call him a Hedgehog, which is not the same as a Porcupine. But you know what? I don't really care. This game has been going on almost two hours. I'm losing my mind. And so I'm going to start tangentially. Ooh, okay, that works. We've seen thorn roots before. This is going to prevent Estrita from moving into lane number three. Actually very, very powerful here. Um, if there's a chasm from Estrita, though, this would be able to cancel it, as thorn roots does require adjacency. So if you have a movement card, Eric, this would be the time to whip it out. Uh, and if you don't, Estrita is stuck in lane number two. which actually would potentially lock. No, you can't both defend lane three and lock Eric's Vorhild out. I don't think, let me see. No, okay, so yeah, never mind. That train of thought does not matter. But Eric is taking long enough that he is considering some sort of response, I assume here, because otherwise he would have done something else. Or perhaps he's just thinking about his final action, which, if you're a Strita, I assume that you lead and just keep forcing the pressure onto Ryan. Brovar has led, or perhaps do you just concede, you skirmish, well, then you open Ryan up to getting an advantage in turn five. So you may not necessarily want to do that. That being said, though, Ryan is a little bit low on cards. Does only have two in the hand. Eric does have four. One of the things about Embassy Ruins... Eh, never mind. Okay, we're going to forget that point there. All right, so we're just going to lead. All right, so that's going to minimize Ryan's ability to control the lane. Um, both players have led from the deck, though, so it will be blind leads. We'll see how that resolves. So Ryan, we only have Vorhild left for both players. Ryan's Vorhild goes... So Ryan's Vore, okay, we're committing to this. Okay, so Ryan is all in on this play. Ryan says, all right, fine. This game either ends here with my victory or my defeat with lane three's resolution. So this game is over one way or the other after this turn. Skirmishes against Vorhild because why not? I guess. Getting a little bit closer. Okay, fair enough. Now, important to note, Eric's Freyhill does have four mana, which means it is entirely possible for Freyhill to chasm or sinkhole Ryan's Vorhild out of... Oh! Zoltan Hungers. Remove the pillar and deal two, two damage to all enemies adjacent to the removed pillar. That's huge. That's going to destroy a lot of Eric's minions. That is significant in terms of swinging damage. Um, wow. Ah, but we're just going to bring out Endless Disciples and LOL, no damage. Now, it is important that Ryan had to remove the pillar foot, which, by the way, I think that was that pillar wasn't adjacent unless he grabbed it from the hex that I wasn't looking at. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they're both going to be safe because Endless Disciples is a thing. Eric also gets to spawn an additional minion. 
which I think is going to seal the game for his victory. Uh, at this point, Ryan does not have three mana on any hero. Vorhild only has one action left. Um, and there are just too many minions for Eric to lose control of the lane and the tower. Uh, so very likely going to be Eric's victory at this point, unless something really weird happens. Um, obviously, Vorhild does take the two damage from the Zoltan Hunger's collapse effect. Um, but again, there hasn't been a lot of hero damage, so who cares? She's at 9 HP, 10. It should be at 10 HP, yes. Uh, oh, no, because the Vorhild ping from the removed pillar. Um, so, yeah, so that makes sense. That's actually a thing as well. Uh, and then Ryan's going to attack the minion. Um, this is probably the best play, uh, but I don't, I still don't think it matters. Um, wasn't that minion, yeah, I was going to say, Ryan, that minion was protected. Why are you targeting that one? Uh, so we see the plus one on the flip there, four damage to the minion, dead minion. Great. Uh, so that's pretty much it. So now Vorhild goes. Um, I guess with Vorhild, you could potentially shoot a minion. Skirmish. Well, do you just lead, I think, then? Shoot a minion and lead as Vorhild? I don't see what else you'd want to do. Kill the minion, lead to ensure, because you have lane 3 1. Like, there is no world with the amount of mana remaining that Ryan can get, save lane 3. So as Eric, all you need to do is not do some weird sequence of events that ends up giving Ryan control. So attack the minion, lead, because Eckert does not count for lane number one. Dead minion, double minus one. Interestingly enough, the disarm would have mattered. Statistically improbable, and yet there we are. We saw the double minus ones twice. Uh, so that actually would have been something that would have been relevant. But, you know, you don't you don't anticipate the double minus ones. And with Haral coming out now, you know, triple minus ones? Ew, Astrida's playing Speak with the Spirits. All right, so taking a look at that. Um, let's get that in range again because that's one of the new cards for us. Actually, it's not that new, but you know, I uh, haven't seen it for much as much for a while. So apply shape shifted, disarm, predict two. So I assume we're going to predict two here as one of the effects. That way, Eric can ensure the lead action is successful. Um, and then I guess disarm or applied the shapeshift to his herself. Uh, yeah, she applied the shapeshift to herself. That makes sense. Um, did not disarm Brilvar. Yeah, that would be a waste of the effect. So the last one, the prediction, uh, I assume is going to be then for Vorhild to get a high mana lead, ensuring that lane one holds and that lane three exploding the nexus for Eric's victory. But we want to make sure that that's actually what happens and don't want to ever call a game too soon. I've definitely done that in the past and then been, hey, by the way, this game is actually not over. So looking very good for uh, Eric right now at this point, but we don't want to say anything until the actual resolution goes through. Um, Vorhild has done her final action with a lead from the hand, so... Apparently, if he was fishing there, didn't find anything useful. We get to the end of the turn. We do math. I'm pretty sure this tower does not explode. There are two heroes for Eric. There are three for Ryan. Plus one minion. Um... Yep, going to ping for the worship action is the last bit there. So again, whatever. A little bit of chip damage, nothing wild. So 
doing the math here, if Vorhild and Nintaka and Lakali all have threes, that should be for Ryan, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. For Eric, that should be four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So yeah, so Eric's tower will hold, a couple minions will die, looks like one or two based on the flipping, and then we have Nexal Destruction in lane number three. So excellent game, good game to Eric, and let's go ahead and talk with the players, see if we can get some insights into this game. If I can figure out where the channel is, that would be great, there we go. and then Zotlin Hunger is over here. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah, that'd be cute. So the other thing is, depending on how this breaks out, I might run Vorhild here, here, and lead. That's why I was waiting on Vorhild to see, because if I feel like you don't have enough shenanigans, but I hadn't, didn't have a lead then, so it was, like, probably not. But I had so many minions, I was like, maybe that's enough of a buffer that I can sneak in the back door to get the Nexus kill. Yeah, yeah. I was... I was not counting on the Endless Disciples. I'm like, I think I've gotten <laughs> yeah. through... I, I didn't think there was any other card you need to worry about. and I think, uh, so what did I, I, I won by two there, right? Yes. You won by two, yeah. So if that, uh, if I had done that Endless Disciples, you would have lost four two more minions. And two towers. Or you would have lost two, so then I won, would have won by four, two, so I still would have been one short. You'd been one short, yeah. But if I don't have an Endless Disciples, then I don't have a minion, so then you do win. If I have nothing else, you win. Because remember, not only does Endless Disciples protect, it also spawns an additional Yep. Oh yeah, no. that's true. So, yep. so, so that, that, endless, the that endless disciple saved it for you there. Yep. I was also hoping to try and use the slide to push Frail out, but I, I wasn't able to and I you were just out of range when you played the endless disciples. Mm. This this minion here got in my way. <laughs> I would have been better off without it. Huh. If I didn't have this minion, I think I win that game. <laughs> that's right. You totally do. Because then I can slide you out to fizzle your Endless Disciples. <laughs> Even though I'm one minute short, it fizzles your Endless Disciples and you lose one control. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's huge. Because that pushes her into the red territory. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. <laughs> so it was a good thing that my Vorhild was collecting all the minions around her. <laughs> Vorhild at 11 terror. at one point. Yes. Almost 12. I don't know if I've ever seen 12 minions around a hero before. Yeah, that was that was wild and i mean it definitely helped with with blocking certain movement effects so very nice <laughs> are you just being kind i mean it was fascinating over here but i'm like yep well okay i got i got an attack i made nantaka attack the outsider for you that was pretty cool that was cool i, I mean i said i mean I, I won't lie i did say i was like this is ultimately pointless because killing the outsider doesn't benefit us hunting for power is not into play it's still nowhere near death range but i mean it's still cool that we get to at least stab the bear and then i didn't even attack back i, I figured was just you wouldn't. scared he can't run i mean no, i figured i figured based on the way the state of the game was going, that attacking back wouldn't have been the correct choice. I figured you were going to use it somehow to try and form a wall to position off, and I, I agree with that play. Based on this, all you had to do was just not lose lane one, and lane three just naturally wins you the game. Right? Yeah, I did miss that you could move Frail into that spot. Um, otherwise, I, I should have used I would have used that Thorn Roots right there mm. on the on the terror when you went to move away with the terror. But I didn't I didn't realize Frail could get there. Got it. Yeah. Huh. That was actually, actually, if I had done that, I win that game, because then you don't have Frail there for the Endless Disciples. I think you're right. I mean, I think Frail yeah. was critical, because I couldn't get Eckerd in there, and Vorhild just can't hold it by herself, as yeah. long as, unless I somehow jack with uh, your Vorhild, and I can't. Yep, the butterfly effect. Yep. Yeah, that, um, that, I, I just, I missed that, that Frail could get there, otherwise I would have. I'm just like, I, I don't see what this move does, and then you did that, I'm like, Oh, oh, I see it <laughs> Enlightenment I has see occurred. It. Yeah. It came out of that. But Thorn Roots, very underrated card. Oh, yeah. It, it I got agree. me the first time. Multiple times this game. Yes. Yeah, when you ran into the dome with Vorhild, I was like, 
dove, 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 and then you do thorn roots. I'm like, oh, or that. Yeah, I was like, I was like, I, I had the question first. I'm like, why, why are we running Vorhild when Astrida has? A, oh, that's <laughs> yeah, why. I had to shape shift too because I was worried about you doing like a, a shove or a mm. redirect on my thorn roots. So I'm like, I got a shape shift here instead of lead, so that way the thorn roots works. Mm. Oh right, because I have two people next. I could redirect it onto Astrida. That's right. funny. <laughs> yes. So I, I, that's why I had to do that shape shift. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I will say, you know, this was a good goodbye game for my sinkholes. Cross the know. map. Thank God. Frail doesn't even seem like she's in part of the thing, and all of a sudden she's affecting the game, right? Yeah, Frail. That was twice that game where Frail just was barely in range to do everything she needed to do. To, like Frail was MVP from a distance. Yeah. So, I mean, just FYI, though, when I when I shoved with the terror, right, I could have shoved down here, which is a little more out, but I put it there just for that reason, so that Frail had a way to grab to Kali. So, I mean, Absolutely. it was partly planned. But, yeah, yes, so it's but like... I also, you know, I didn't expect that you had two sinkholes and a chasm in it. That chasm, was tragic. You know. yeah. That, that, yeah. That, like, made I, me, that made me die inside a little bit, not going to lie. Well, you're never going to see it again, RG. I know, it's well, so great. Uh, well, not, not the form. <laughs> Obviously, we've, we have a iterated version that's coming up with the Sky Terror re-release, but... Sure, yeah. That's way far By the way, if we, did have, if we did go into another turn, then Taka was going to nuke somebody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, somebody was dead. I honestly... Granted, it wasn't going to be Vorhild because she had a minion barrier. I honestly <laughs> thought the play when you won the Terror, if, if like, because obviously I didn't have the thing turned on to see what the cards were in your hand, and I, I had it zoomed in, so I haven't been looking at what was being flipped for the discard, only the modifiers as they flashed up. But I was thinking there was a world where you just move Nantaka over and just instantly kill Vorhild, and it's like, well, dead heroes can't lead. Hmm. Yeah, I was I was thinking that I just I move Eckert out slow, put you in the corner there, block, make a wall so Eckert couldn't get him. Sure. And I had my minion, everything positioned in a way that Eckert wasn't going to be able to contribute at all. I literally said to Eric at one point um, during that round, I'm like, I feel like I just song of the siren to Eckert. Yep, it was so Pretty good, much. and I, I was like, <laughs> she's dead, and I'm like, I've really got to get next to the call because it, I mean. I don't know how suspicious it was that I moved Ekrit when she wasn't getting anywhere. Like, I could theoretically hope you were moving away or something like that so I can get back in the lane. Mm. But I was like, no, I got to look at Takali in that bush before she does whatever it is she's going to do. Mm. And sure enough, that was the chasm. So I just figured you were trying to get closer because, I mean, what else were you going to do? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, as a delaying tactic. And I also was fair. thinking there was a, a potential for, like, a chasm or something to try and move yourself in, although I already looked at your discard and saw you didn't have it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, the, the lead action that you took with Eckerd there, was that just because you didn't have anything else to do, I assume, or...? I, no, I mean, so number one, I totally could have attacked a minion. Right. Um, <laughs> That's why I was, I was, was actually, confused. Yeah, my wife, so I, I will blame that one on my wife. She was pinging me on the phone and my son needed some help, and so I was like, okay, uh, wow. all I gotta do is is get next to him for Yikes. the redirect, and then I was like, nothing else matters, and so I just led... Mm. I, well, okay, in my head I was like, I will pretend I'm threatening a sinkhole to switch us in or something, even okay, though that's fair. Ryan, sure, Ryan sure. already knew that I was out of sinkholes, so like yeah, it was. Of an course, empty I forgot threat. about it. So you know. I mean, that's the thing. <laughs> Got to pay attention to the deck. But yeah, yeah. The, I mean, it was a horrible turn, right? Like, my job was to get there. Right. But then I was like, oh look, I can at least put a min uh, my um, illusion. Uh, illusion down and attack this pillar over here and then I go to do it I'm like wait that's five away it's yep. four from the illusion I thought, you were okay. I thought you were trying to blast Nantaka and move her out of the way and I'm like but she's shapeshifted you can't move her sir yeah I was just going for a pillar because gotcha. the way in my head the way I was going to lose here was unburial rights I mean there's other yeah. ways right like you said right. he had met a lot of ways to do it but unburial rights was like I can't protect stuff that's right. that'll just be mm. too many right so yes. that was the card I was super worried about so any time to kill a pillar would have been good right and then yeah, then I just fizzled the end of that turn. But Yeah, the other thing I missed, too, um, I don't know if it would have been correct or not, but that Endless Disciples I had, I thought about using it the turn before with Grovar to move a minion over. That does, I mean, that type of one thing and this thing yeah. snowballs, right? Yeah, because so, right. that would have that affected last round and this round. Now, what that also does, though, and I don't know how much it matter, then mm, the token would be yeah. here instead of here. So now your tower is under threat. So right. maybe I can 
actually think about because when it was here, I was like, I'm just abandoning this lane. Right. And then I did well, math. I, I did like, that turn, so it was gonna, or yeah, it was moving to this spot anyway, which is why, I was, like, so either way, at this this round, it would have been threatened. Mm. No, no, but when you didn't do it right, didn't move the guy away, you ended up ended up here, right? One forward. Um. No, so I'm talking about the no, round. No, it was oh, after. Here. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So that yeah. You're, you're right. So the round, oh. the round at the end of that round, it moved it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, that might have done it, but then you wouldn't have it on the next turn to protect. So I don't know, right? Things would. Yeah, that, that's why I was like, no, I think I'm gonna stick with this wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, there was also the. Oh, oh my God! It was so unfortunate too. When you spawn that minion here. Yes, and you could have and put your pillar down first. Yes, I, I, I wanted to actually put pillar down first. But the other thing was, I had the shield slam in my hand. I'm like, why does Nantaka not have armor? Because <laughs> <laughs> she's an assassin. Assassins don't have armor, Ryan. You know this. I know, but I was just like looking at this. I'm like, oh my god, I really wish Nantaka had armor right now. But yeah, if I had worship first, I would have been in a much better spot because there, I wanted... So, I said this to uh, Eric before you came in here, but my plan here on that attack, um, I was trying to, I was going to try and kill that minion, then slide Vorhild over to here. Okay. And then um, worship to put a pillar here. Mm. Move around, and then Zotlin Hunger is over here. Okay, that would have been big. So I was trying to, you know, protect all my things and then get rid of these. Sure. That would have been big. Um, yeah, but then you had the... Uh... Oh, and then also... I was originally, when I did that terror play and moved you over in the corner, I was originally thinking, oh, and then I'll go with Nantaka first, bring Nantaka in here, do all that. And then right when I went to start return, I'm like, oh, wait, if I do that, then Ekrit can get in. Right. Oh, I guess I'll go with Ekrit first. And then he did that and disciples, and I was sad. Sad days. <laughs> yeah, the game of double sinkhole, well, in the chasm, and then double endless disciple. Oh. Actually, triple, right? You did one also. I mean, yeah. It was back and forth, and then double redirect, which I needed both of those. Yeah. I double can't redirect. wait for untamed cards. Uh, it's There's gonna be good. Gonna be did so you use that second redirect violence. again? You? What did you do? Chasm. You uh, had the redirect, and you—he was chasm. gonna make the chasm yeah, to yeah. break that, and then he, yeah. you used redirect on the chasm to make it. Right. So you used them both on that one stack. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The attack and then the chasm, all to save a minion. Which, to be fair, was worth. Yep. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, and I used multiple cards to, you know, well, well actually, I only used the chasm to try and save that. Well, I, I used the shield slam too, but that was just. Wait, yeah. wasn't it, was it an attack or was it a. So so the attack was on the minion. It was a which bewitch. You, no, it was a bewitch, right? Was it a bewitch? I forget it this time. It was something. This room. No, no, it was just the attack. That was the attack that round. Yeah, yeah I thought it was the it, attack because you, you redirected it to the outsider, and then he tried yeah. to chasm the person that was playing the redirect out of. Uh, to make it so that you couldn't see her to redirect it, and then you just said, "No, we're just going to redirect that too." Yeah, the redirect, the redirect on Bewitch was the turn before. So actually, Ekrit has an illusion there. So actually, the chasm was to get the outsider away, so that my redirect would fizzle, so that he would attack. Right, the right. That, yeah, that's what that's what I meant. Yeah. He, he was trying to get yeah, Nantaka yeah. into the cover hex where Freyho is right now, so that you couldn't target her with, or that you uh, couldn't. Well, not, that could work too. Yeah, yeah, okay. I just thought if you get the outsider away, and you can leave Nantaka there. Also, not. Yeah, yeah. Either way, yeah. Either way, the yeah. the point was yeah. to make it so that the redirect would have felt somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think the first. So after you did the sinkhole, I went to Kazan to push myself. Uh, back over, or that was sorry. We're talking two different things here. With the bewitch, I used the. I went to push myself back over there, uh, but yeah, with the redirect off of the the chasm. Yeah, the chasm was to just push the um, the tear away, and I figured, mm. oh, might as well push Eckert in the process. Because mm. <laughs> which not? is why, I, like, I guess I'll shield slam the illusion first. Fair enough. I'm like, I'm nothing, nothing better to do with the shield slam. Slakali mm -hmm. is stuck here in the corner and yep. Vorhild and Nantaka don't have any armor and Brovar's not using it for anything so Brovar did a good job though denying the Estrita minion changes though she, he did he, uh, I, I, I told Ryan to prove to me that Brovar's still good on this map and he certainly did just follow Estrita yeah, around granted, and make her life miserable if Brovar was over here it would have been a little bit better because I could have been taunting multiple heroes usually that kind, that kind of uh, behavior results in a restraining order though Ryan <laughs> uh, 
All right, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap this one up? So first of all, again, congrats, Eric, moving on to the next round. Um, yep, con congrats, Eric. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully good, good luck on winning your second world qualifier out of two world qualifiers this season. This is the third. Uh, who won the first one? Oh, this is the third one? I thought this yeah, was the third there was one. A, I know you there won the last one. Well, there was an Ashen Pass one. Yeah, this is the third uh, one. That um, an Italian. Oh, boy. I'm blanking on his name now. <laughs> Sir, you're in charge of the competitive scene. We expect mm -hmm. all of these notes to be, like, meticulously kept yeah. and known at the drop of a hat. Da, 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 da. Oh, was it, like, a... Uh, um... Leozar or something? No. No. It's, somebody's been around for a while. Oh, this is embarrassing. I've uh -oh. played him many... We'll come back to that. I, Congratulations I, I, I... to all those who have qualified and the winner of this world <laughs> qualifier who will also make it into the world qualifiers. Again, looking forward to that because that's coming up pretty soon here. We're at the end of August. Championships are coming up here in Q4, so they're right around the corner. Yeah, and... Uh... Have we given you guys a date for the last chance qualifier yet? Because that's nope. going to be a single day tournament. Okay. Well, when Giacomo lets us release that, we will. But there will be in November a single day tournament for uh, last chance. Good deal. All right. All right. Well, then, on uh, behalf of Eric and Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the presentation, and we'll see you guys next time. Have a great one. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>